salutations once again to the Truth Core, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. Here I am again with the continuation now in the year 2021 of the parable of the golden eggs. So the parable tells you in the form of a little story in which you participate, a story in which you place yourself, it tells you that the first golden egg is common sense. And the exercise of the narrative for the story shows you or places you in the park where you receive this golden egg. It drops into the palm of your hand. And who gives it to you? Well, you don't know, and you don't need to know. It actually comes from a stranger, an anonymous donor. Now, there is a way that I could elaborate a little bit on this theme of the anonymous donor. Let's see if I can just do that for a moment before we go to the story of the second egg. You all have parents, and you know the names of your parents, and perhaps the names of your grandparents and your great-grandparents. And if you've done some ancestral in investigation, as some people like to do these days using the internet tools of research, you might in fact know the names of some of your genetic bloodline ancestors going all the way back to who knows when, the 14th century, the 12th century, something like that. But as you go back in time tracing the line of your genetic ancestry, your genealogical lineage, there comes a point where you don't know who they are anymore and they stand as it were, like anonymous donors in your life. So if you're Spanish, then you have Spanish ancestors who were living in the year 415 and who were living in the year 5 of the Christian calendar and who were living in the year 500 BC and who were living in the year 5000 BC. But you don't know the names of any of those ancestors, do you? So at the far end of the line of your genealogical ancestry, the people who are responsible for you being here as the ultimate product are anonymous. And in fact, those are the anonymous donors who gave you the first egg, who give it to you. You see, common sense is a great subject, and I would love to talk about it at length. There are many ways to look at it, to ask what it is, and there are also really important questions to be asked about why some people, and even some groups of people, or races of people, seem to be deficient in common sense, the evidence being in what they can achieve in practical terms, and others seem to be more proficient in common sense. And these are intriguing questions, but it would be a digression for me to go off and consider any of those questions. So rather than go into that digression, I would appreciate it if you would consider this point, this statement. Common sense is an inheritance from a line of anonymous ancestors that comes through a process called the inheritance 
of acquired traits. Have you ever heard that expression, the inheritance of acquired traits? Actually, that is a theory of human evolution. It's an alternative theory, a kind of underdog theory. And it is usually associated with a French philosopher named Lamarck. So it's called Lamarckian theory. As a matter of fact, it is the main theory that stands in strong competition to the theory of Darwinian evolution. So if that intrigues you, I suggest that you go and investigate it by looking up Lamarck, L-A-M-A-R-C-K, or the inheritance of acquired traits. The point I want to make here is simply that common sense is inherited in that way through a line of ancestors. And it just so happens to be a fact which is evident in the world, is evident in the achievements of different cultures, of different races through history, that some lineages produce more common sense. They produce a stronger quantum of common sense in the descendants of that specific genealogical lineage, that those people have contributed to the practical construction of the world and the practical construction of the social order and of everything that it takes to build the infrastructure for a society. All of that has been created by human animals who have common sense. Of course, it gets to be developed in very specialized ways. For instance, the science of engineering that is required to build bridges or to build boats that sail across the ocean is a specialized area of knowledge that can be taught and transmitted. But in order to, in order to demonstrate that knowledge, in order to implement it and prove that you have it, there has to be a basic quantum of common sense and everything grows out of the foundation of common sense that leads to the great contributions that make the world a good place to live in. One final point I want to make about common sense is that even though it is acquired, the inheritance of acquired traits, through particular racial lines, everyone who acquires it no matter what race they belong to, ends up with the same gift, the same capacity, because common sense is absolutely generic. If you have it, it's the same kind of common sense that everyone else has. It's a universal attribute. But nevertheless, the way that you as an individual acquired it is through inheriting the acquired lessons of trial and error of your racial ancestors. So it is racially derived, but when you acquire it, it is a universal and generic capacity. Think about that. So having said all that, you can see that you now know who the stranger is who gives you the first golden egg. You don't know him or her by name. At a certain point, tracing back your ancestral lineage, all of your forebears are anonymous, aren't they? So the sum total of all of those anonymous individuals in your lineage appear to you in the form of this stranger who gives you the first golden egg. So what about the second golden egg? Well, what kind of a gift is that? And how do you acquire it? And who do you acquire it from? Here the parable changes. And the parable works 
if you get it in the way it's intended, it works simply by impressing on your mind this difference. For the first golden egg, you don't know who's giving it to you. For the second golden egg, you must know who's giving it to you or else you cannot receive it. So what does the parable tell you or teach you next? Well, it teaches you or it invites you to learn that there is another faculty of sense that you don't have unless you know who gives it to you. And it teaches you to accept in all humility and honestly that you don't have that other sense except on those exact conditions. You don't have the sense represented by the second golden egg. You don't have it innate and inherent in the way you have common sense. But you can. You can have it in the same way. So common sense is whatever it is. And the parable leads you to consider what might be called uncommon sense. And that definition fits perfectly. Why is it uncommon sense? Because it's not common for people to have it. Can you see that? It's not common. Yet it can be acquired in a certain way. Now this is a rather odd proposition. I agree. And since I'm telling you this parable, I take the responsibility for orientation. Let's see if I can orient you to this other form of sense before I tell you exactly what it is. I'm making the statement that it is not common for human animals, human beings of any race to possess this other form of sense. However, you might find it interesting to know that a lot of people think they do have it. They do think they do have it. And how do they define it then? How do they describe it to themselves? How do they tell themselves that they have this other kind of sense? Well, they all do it in the same way. They all say, in one way or another, in one language or another, in one cultural idiom or another, they all say that they feel the presence of God. They feel the presence of the divine. And often, with this claim, I feel, I have my sense of my connection to God. I sense the presence of God in my life. Often when people express that, it comes with certain connotations. It's a loaded proposition. And two of the connotations go like this. I am sure that God sees me. God is aware that I am alive. That's one assumption. The other assumption is, I love God. I love God and I am devoted to God. So for most human animals around the world, there is a sense of devotion to God and that is taken for the uncommon sense. It takes the place of it and it satisfies people even though it is not the genuine article. That being so, you can be assured that anyone, and I mean anyone, who claims that they feel the presence of God 
They sense God in their lives and they feel love for God and they want to be devoted to God. They want to worship God. They want to worship the divine in whatever way they define it or picture it according to their culture. You can be sure that such people are seriously deluded. And the brutal truth is they do not have what they claim, divine sense, common sense and uncommon sense. And uncommon sense can be called divine sense. And there are many people who live in a state of delusion and they live in the illusion of their particular religion or their spiritual view falsely assuming that they have divine sense, and they don't. There is only one way for any human being of any race or culture to acquire divine sense. And unless they have it in that way, they don't have it at all. Of course, that is just my personal opinion, right? That is just what John Lamb Lash thinks, right? And who am I to discount and deny in any other human being their sense for the divine, their sense for the presence of God in their lives? Who am I to do that? Well, I don't know how to answer that except to say, I, who am I? I am the individual who does just that. And what if it's true? Regardless of how it appears, regardless of the outrageous presumption of what I'm saying, regardless of how mad and arrogant it appears, what if it's true? Now, I'm not going to say much more to keep this talk as short as it can be. And I will reserve for the next talk the complete description of how to acquire divine sense, consistent with the parable of the golden eggs. But I will leave you with this message. I will leave you with this little piece of advice if you don't mind. You might certainly take what I'm saying as a personal and subjective idea that is unique to me, the man who represents himself as a teacher of the living gnosis today. And I can assure you that this idea is my idea and the language in which I'm expressing it is unique to me. But it's not an idea or proposition that I created out of nothing. It is actually an idea, a Gnostic proposition, you could say, that has been stated here and there in certain teachings down through the ages. So there is a spiritual tradition, if you wish to call it that, which has left evidence in writings which refer to divine sense and also specify the condition for receiving it, which is the same condition that I am stating in this particular syntax and my particular style. And one of the traditions where this is found, and it is a rare gem to find it, is in the so-called Hermetica. Now, there's a lot of garbage associated with the Hermetica and the Hermetic school of ancient Egypt and the so-called science of Hermetics associated with 
Hermes, which is a Greek name for a certain divine being that is the equivalent of Toth, the Egyptian Toth or Toth Hermes. What is the Hermetic tradition? Well, in a way, it's kind of long lost cousin to Gnosis. And in the Hermetic tradition, you find preserved in the Corpus Hermeticum, there is an exact statement of the proposition for acquiring divine sense. That document is in Latin, it's called the Asclepius. And the exact words in that document are, in Latin, Divina Sensu, Divine Sense. So there is evidence of this proposition, and there is evidence of everything that I am saying. So you may, if you wish, dismiss it and reject it, because it appears to be coming from some self-important individual who claims to know something that no one else knows. But as a matter of fact, I am not alone in teaching about divine sense. That is a fact. I am not. It is inherent to the true tradition of Hermetics as well as to the living Gnosis today. Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.